On this Mother's Day, I will be preaching a sermon on a very special mother, St. Rita of Cassia, who is right here on the altar on the right side, the one dressed in black with the wound in her head, in her forehead. Now, St. Rita is known as the patron saint of impossible cases because of her ability to answer even the most difficult and most seemingly impossible requests. She is a perfect role model for any woman since she lived a single life for many years. She was a mother, she was a wife, she was a widow, and finally a nun. But anyone can follow her example of holiness. Now, in the year 1309, in the village of Roca Perena, which is in northern Italy, about three miles from Cassia, there was a marriage between a man named Antonio Mancini and a woman named Amata Ferri. They were a very holy and pious couple. They were known for their charity and their great zeal for souls. They would often help bring many grievous and public sinners to confessions or to confession by the words of kindness and fraternal correction, which was done so charitably so as not to embarrass them. But they inspired them with hope of God's divine mercy. Now they cooled the hearts of men that were inflamed with revenge at the slightest violation of their honor. Now, this was a time, of course, when the vendetta was popular in Italy. And this vendetta was a common right by law. It was considered as a right and justice to exact revenge in order to honor one's name. Now, because of their charity, the Mancinis were known in Rocca Perena as the peacemakers of Jesus Christ. Now, this couple loved each other very much, but they had no children, and they were getting on in years. Now, one night, while Amata Mancini was praying in her home, an angel appeared to her in a vision and told her that she would have a daughter who from her birth would be marked with holiness, be gifted with every virtue, and that she was to be the helper of the helpless and the afflicted, and that she would be a guiding star in the church. Now, this was much like St. Elizabeth when she conceived St. John the Baptist in her old age. Now, in the decree of canonization of St. Rita, we learn that the angel in the vision announced to Amata that she would call her child Rita, a name never known before to the world. Her name, too, like St. John the Baptist, came directly from heaven. So little Rita Mancini was born to Antonio and Amata on May 22, in 1381, She was baptized four days later in the Church of St. Mary's in Cassia. On the day after her baptism, a swarm of white bees hovered over the angelic face of little Rita, and they landed in her mouth, and they entered and left without causing her any harm or without waking her. Now, the mystery of these bees would be revealed later. Little Rita Mancini began living a saintly life from the very moment of her baptism, when her soul was purified and filled with sanctifying grace. She didn't find much joy or much joy in children's games, but she played them anyway because she saw how much joy it brought to the children. But once the games were over, she would return to her solitude and prayer. She would always go to a remote remote corner of the house to meditate on the passion of our Lord, and this was her favorite devotion throughout life. Now, one of little Rita's greatest joys was to go to the church with her parents and then find a hidden corner in the church and say one Hail Mary and then begin meditating upon our Lord's passion. She was devoted to the poor, even as a child. And when she was served dinner, she would eat very little and she would hold much of it back so that after the meal she could go to the neighbor's house and bring this food to the children. The people of Roca Perena saw how holy and different little Rita was from the other children, and many mothers in the village would encourage their daughters to behave like her. But as St. Rita grew older, she desired to hide much from the world and to live a hidden life in a cave so she could spend the rest of her life in prayer and contemplation. She even built a little room or oratory right next to the house, and she only came out when necessary to speak to her parents. Now, during that year of solitude, she spent her time meditating on the sorrowful mysteries of our Lord's Passion. She even painted the walls of the oratory with scenes of the Passion to inspire greater devotion in the sufferings of Christ. 
and also by looking at these pictures that kept, this kept her from distractions during her prayer. Her heart was so attracted by our Lord that she desired nothing more than to have and possess the love of the crucified Savior. But after that year, she saw that her mother needed more help since her father was getting old and it became harder and harder for him to get around. So Rita spent these days working in the house and doing all the works of a housekeeper. But she still continued to pray. She did this work with so much love and intensity because she wanted to please God. And when she was 12 years old, she she received an Augustinian breviary. And at this moment, she decided to consecrate her virginity to God and enter the order founded by St. Augustine. St. Augustine was also one of her patron saints. So one night she decided she would go to the living room where her parents were sitting. She kissed both their hands and she knelt at their feet. And she told them that she had made up her mind to become a nun. But her parents were saddened by this. And they reminded her that she was their only child. Who's going to take care of them in their old age? And who would carry on the family name? Now, St. Rita always did what her parents wanted, even before they would ask. But this decision by her parents tore her apart interiorly. But she wanted to honor her parents, so she sacrificed her own will. She promised that she would remain with them while they lived, but she promised God that she would never embrace the married state. This consoled her in the tremendous sacrifice that she was making. But her parents had already made up, her mind, or made up their minds that she would marry. When they finally told her this, it broke her heart, and she responded by saying the, follow, the following words. She said, My parents, I do not wish any spouse but Jesus Christ. Years ago, I dedicated my whole body, heart, and soul to his holy sacrifice because you wished it. I gave my promise not to enter the convent. I feel sure with the help of God, without embracing the married state, that I would be able to console and comfort you and provide for all your necessities and get, until God calls you to a better and happier home. But her parents insisted that she was to be married. So she took this to God in prayer, and she reminded him of her promise of virginity and her desire to enter the religious life. But she would wait for his answer. Now it was in this prayer that God revealed to her that he wanted her to marry. So she submitted herself to the will of God and didn't complain anymore. In those days, marriages were arranged by the families. Now, Rita Mancini was esteemed throughout the region as a virtuous and holy woman. She was the woman that every parent wanted for their son. And so a wealthy and noble family presented their son to the Mancini family, and the parents accepted. This man's name was Ferdinando. Now, although his parents were honorable, Ferdinando was a proud and violent man, and he wasn't by any means a religious man. But he had hidden this well through human respect when he came to know the Mancini family. But after he married Rita, he began to reveal his true character. His words to Rita were harsh and cruel, and he would often go into a tirade when she would speak, and also, especially, when she tried to calm him down. Now, under this stress, the average wife would have had a mental breakdown, but not Rita. She set it in her mind to convert her husband's heart and bring him to God. She suffered the abuse of her cruel husband in silence and patience. Ferdinando would also spend much time gambling the the money of the family, the money that was used to support the family, and then falsely accuse Rita of spending that money extravagantly. But every saint is honored by the perfection of certain virtues. And we could truly say about Saint Rita that hers were patience and humility. She always took great care to make sure that the house was clean and her husband's clothes were always cleaned, neat, and pressed. Saint Rita never left the house except to go to Mass and Vespers or to visit her parents in old age. She did all of this because of her love, because of her love for God. And she knew that she showed this love of God by pleasing her husband. Now her husband finally became aware of his temper and his severity towards Rita by her heroic patience, her charity, and her constant loving corrections. So he changed his ways and he began to imitate his saintly wife's example. Now she suffered a lot for it, but her patience and humility led her husband back to the faith and their home became a place of holiness. 
After her husband's interior conversion, Ferdinando and Rita brought two children into the world. They were both boys, Giovanni and Paolo. They grew up to be honest and obedient boys, but the suffering for this family was not over. Before his interior conversion, of course, Ferdinando was very hot-headed and violent, and he had gotten into many fights, a few with knives, and he usually ended up hurting his enemies very severely. But one evening, one of his enemies got his friends together, and as cowards usually do, they waited outside the gates of the town of Roca Perena as he was going home. And as he walked by, they jumped him and they stabbed him to death, and leaving him bleeding outside the walls. Now the news of this broke Rita's heart, because her husband was becoming a holy and a good and honest man. But in that time, that period in Italy, although immoral, the vendetta, or the act of vengeance by family members, was a right by law. Now he had spoken of this before, and this time her husband's family was trying to encourage her two boys to, to seek vendetta against, this, against these men, because everybody knew who the men were that had murdered her husband. So Rita prayed to God that he would take her sons before her sons would decide or have the opportunity to kill her husband's murderers. And shortly after this prayer, both of her boys became sick and died. And so God answered this heroic prayer. And so she accompanied our sorrowful mother, not just in the sacrifice of one son, but in the sacrifice of both of her sons. But then after this, St. Rita publicly forgave the murderers of her husband. Now we can pray to her whenever we have a difficulty in forgiving others, because St. Rita had this great virtue of forgiveness. And not long after this, both of St. Rita's parents died. So she was now a widow and an orphan, and she was alone in the world. But now St. Rita could begin to live the penitential life at home that she had always dreamed of in her youth, growing every day in divine love. And one day while at Mass, she was listening to a sermon where the priest quoted the words of our Lord, If thou wilt be perfect, go sell what thou hast, give to the poor, and come follow me. She saw this as the divine invitation to enter into religious life, just like St. Benedict. And so she left on a journey by foot to the Augustinian convent of St. Mary Magdalene and Cassia to see if they would accept her. So she told the prioress of her desire to enter the convent. But the prioress responded by telling her, that in the rule of St. Benedict, only young women were allowed to enter, and they could, only with special permission, accept widows. But they had never done this before, and they didn't want to start now. But St. Rita wasn't deterred by this. She stayed with the family for a short time in Cassia and returned to the convent to ask again. But a second time, she was refused. She tried a third time, but this time the prioress told her, that it was impossible for her to admit her as a member of the community and that she should stop asking. So St. Rita decided to take it to prayer. She especially pray- prayed to her patron saints, St. Augustine, St. Nicholas of Tolentino, who were both, of course, St. Nicholas of Tolentino Augustinian, and also St. John the Baptist. These are the three great saints that she honored. But one night she fell asleep praying for this intention, and she heard the words, Come, Rita, my beloved. It is now time for you to enter the Madalena convent, whose door was so often closed against you. She opened her eyes and went to the window and saw a man dressed in camel's hair with a leather girdle, and he made signs to her that she should follow him. So he took her to the top of a hill, and she was met by two other men, and she understood all these three men to be her patron saints, St. Augustine, St. Nicholas, and St. John the Baptist. She knelt before them, but they told her or commanded her to rise and to follow them. And they led her to the convent, and her heart was filled with great joy. Now even though the doors and windows were locked, she found herself in the cloister, that is the interior walls of the convent, and they left her with these words. Rita, remain a rational bee in the garden of the spouse whom you have so long and ardently loved. You are now in the house of your spouse, Jesus. Love him with all your heart and soul, and your eternal salvation is secure. Return thanks to God for so great a favor done on your behalf. 
praise His infinite mercy, and publish that there is nothing impossible to God. Rita, the impossible is overcome in your behalf. Now, when the nuns woke up in the morning to find St. Rita there, they were shocked and surprised and thought that one of the sisters or one of the porters had forgotten to lock up the doors and windows. But St. Rita, with all humility, told them, I am that poor widow of Roca Perena, who many times asked to be admitted as a member of your community, but was so many times refused. She told them of the story of how St. John the Baptist, St. Augustine, and St. Nicholas of Tolentino had brought her here miraculously, and again she asked to be accepted. This time the nun, seeing the hand of God in all of this, immediately and in one voice accepted. She had given up everything she owned, even her homeland, and that's why she is called St. Rita of Cassia and not St. Rita of Roca Perena. She was a model novice, perfectly obedient in all things. And in a test of obedience that her prioress had given her, she one time asked her to water a dead plant every day. Now she did this for every day for a whole year. She did it because she knew her divine spouse wanted it. And after a whole year, her divine spouse rewarded it, rewarded this great virtue of obedience by having the flower blossom before her. She lived her vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience perfectly. She wore one habit her whole life. Even though it had been patched up, this thing didn't matter to her. She wore it because she had a great devotion to the virtue of poverty. She was also buried in this habit, and it still adorns her incorrupt body today. She fasted every day, and she never looked at anything that would be a temptation against holy purity. Now, one time, a Franciscan friar came to preach a mission on the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. This mission was focused specifically on the suffering caused by the crown of thorns. Now, this overwhelmed her with tears of sorrow for her sins. And when she returned to her cell, she prostrated herself before a crucifix. And it was at that moment that an inspiration came to her. She wanted to suffer a portion of our Lord's passion. So she asked God for the pain that he suffered in one of the thorns in his crowned head. Immediately after this, a thorn projected from the crucifix of our Lord straight into St. Rita's forehead, and it penetrated her flesh and her skull. This caused excruciating pain, which continued until the death of her, the end of her life. But St. Rita immediately thanked God for this gift. This wound also gave off a terrible odor. This was to protect her humility. And in the wound, there were also worms which moved about. And this helped strengthen her in the virtue of patience. She continued her severe penances and fastings. But as she got older, she became very sick. While she was in bed with a severe illness, her cousin stopped by the convent because, or to, to visit her. And St. Rita asked her when she visited, to go to her, her home in Roca Perena. And in that, she would find a rose. And she also told her to pick two, fig, two figs from a frozen fig tree that was there. Now, this was in the month of January. This is why everything was frozen. Now, her cousin thought that she was delirious. And she said, that's impossible. But St. Rita said to her, nothing is impossible with God. So the woman went to her house and found a rose and two figs and brought it back to her. And that is why on her feast day, roses are blessed and handed out to the faithful in honor of this great miracle. Now, what was the point of this miracle? This was a sign that she was about to see our Lord and pass from this world to the next. When we read the Canticles of Canticles in the Old Testament, it says the following, Arise, make haste, my love, my dove, my beautiful one, and come. For winter is now past, the flowers have appeared, and the fig tree hath put forth her green figs. St. Rita clearly understood this passage in Scripture. And then our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to her along with our Blessed Mother to tell her that her time on earth was short. And he said the following, I am your celestial spouse, who kindled in your heart the fire of divine love, and fill your soul with the virtues 
I have now come to tell you glad and joyful news. Rita, within a few days, you will depart from this world to enjoy the eternal rest in your celestial country. So St. Rita asked forgiveness of all the sisters who knelt around her deathbed. Then she asked permission from her superior to die. This again was an attribute of her holy obedience. And her last words to her sisters were, May God bless you, and may you always remain in holy peace and love with your beloved spouse, Jesus Christ. She died on May 22nd in the year 1457. Now many miracles were attributed to St. Rita. In her tomb, in her casket right now, her body is incorrupt, and it's a glass casket, so you could see through her. You could, you could see through the casket, and you could see her body. Well, during World War II, the Allies were about to bomb the entire area of where her town was. Now, during that time when the when the aircraft were overhead, her body rose up in the glass coffin, and her city, the city of Cassie, was spared this bombing. But also many women can appeal to St. Rita who are not able to bear children, and you will bear children because she's miraculous in this too. Now we also spoke of the bees. The bees came to the convent when St. Rita entered the convent miraculously, and they've been there ever, ever since. Now every Holy Week, the bees leave the convent and they return on her feast day, May 22nd. Now, I have a very special devotion to St. Rita, and I will be going to Cassia in the following week to be there on her feast day to offer thanksgiving for all the special favors that she's given me, especially a particular big favor that she had answered on my behalf, one that to me was completely impossible, but it happened. So if any of you have intentions that you wish me to take there, please bring them to me and have them to me before us or by Sunday of next week. I'll be leaving on Sunday, so please bring them to me. Also, there is a novena to St. Rita, and I don't have them with me right, right now, but they are at the entrances, uh, to both entrances to the church, so please take one. The novena begins today, the 13th of May, and continues until the 22nd of May. Please pray this novena. If there's anything impossible, or think that there's something that's impossible that can never be answered, go to St. Rita. She will answer this prayer. I guarantee this. I have a personal experience in this, but not only that, She's the, she's the saint or the patron of the impossible. And also, if you read her biography, you'll read all the miracles, the cases that were impossible that she answered. St. Rita can do it. Believe me, she can do it. So please pray to St. Rita. Have a special devotion to her. She's a patron saint of all women. She's a patron saint of mothers, patron saint of widows, patron saint of nuns, patron saint of single women.